this is, goes back to the issue about the left and the right labeling. I would say that if we're going to move on in understanding what's going on in the 21st century, there is a resurgence of a certain kind of right that is more nationalistic. And what it is arguing that what we need to do is channel our identity with our people, with our ethnic group, uh, that you're not primarily an individual, you are a member of this group, and that groups need to understand that they are in contestation with the other groups around the world, that we're not all going to be free traders and cosmopolitan. And so a certain segment of the right is going in that direction. Uh, and there is, of course, the left, including the postmodern left, and they are much more wrapped up in identity politics and victim politics. Uh, and they don't uh, uh, agree with the right, obviously, but they have the same irrationalist and contesting and conflictual or understanding of the way the world works. So that kind of right and that kind of left are in collision with each other. But there is a very third distinct type, and that is the, the classically liberal that needs an updating, <laughs> where we genuinely believe that human beings are rational and they should be decent and that we should be peaceful and that we should trade with each other. And that's going to require a certain amount of tolerance. So at a minimum, we have a three-way battle culturally going on. Politics is a manifestation of that, but I really think it's a cultural values battle first. The government that I was part of for a long time, our leader often used to say that we were uh, the repository in this country of uh, classic liberalism and of conservatism. Mm. And I think one of the things that a conservative would have brought to that argument would to say would be to say uh, we're all we should never lose sight of human nature that we're all a mixture of good and bad we can all make good choices all make bad choices the classic liberal would say as you've just done we've got to play to our better angels mm. so to speak yeah and create as far as possible uh, an understanding about individual responsibility responsibility to one another. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, not look to excessive government. But that comes back to the issue. We're outsourcing so much of our conscience and our responsibility now to government and its instruments. Mm -hmm. Well, the first, yeah, there's two things uh, built into your, your good question there. Yeah, the first is uh, the point about human nature, and that if we are going to design uh, or set principles in place for healthy civil society and healthy politics. It has to be based on a proper understanding of human nature. And that means we have to do good philosophy. It really is a philosophical battle. What, what is constant in human nature? What is changeable in human nature? What capacities do we have? What weaknesses do we have? And only to the extent that we get that right will we uh, have principles in place that will enable human beings to, to flourish to flourish the best. So uh, absolutely uh, a philosophical battle has to go on. But what we then have right now, and this is part of the outsourcing point that goes on here, is that one of those issues of human nature is, do you think as a matter of human beings, uh, human nature rather, that human beings do have a powerful capacity for agency? that I can decide I'm going to think for myself and formulate my own beliefs, that I have all of these passions and desires, that I can train my emotions and self-regulate my emotions, and that behaviorally, whatever I think and feel, I am the one who pushes the trigger or steps on the gas, and I take then responsibility for my actions. So to the extent that you think human beings as individuals do have this powerful capacity for agency that has a moral implication. You're going to see human beings as moral agents and you will expect them to take full responsibility for good or for bad, for what they think, for what they say, for what they do. And the fruits of their labors for good or bad will, will belong to them. And then that will have political implications as well. So then you will say, if we think that individuals are powerfully agents, then we want a government that individuals do for themselves. Now we'll do that socially, but that almost always comes out in some sort of democratic Republican politics. You have your ideas and your goals. I have my ideas and my goals. To a large extent, we go off our own separate ways and we do our things, but of course we want to come together for lots of various things. So we have to have lots of discussion, find common ground, compromise when we can compromise. 
and uh, we'll just have then uh, whatever rules that are going to be commonly in place will be ones that we are going to do it. So democracy is really a do-it-yourself kind of political system, but it depends on a strong sense of individual agency. Now, if though, you have a very different understanding of human nature, you don't believe in human agency. You think that what people think is conditioned into them yeah. by the social forces right, that they are born into. That you know, there's a linguistic version of this. We all learn different languages, but built into the grammars of different languages are, are very different assumptions about the way the world works. But human beings are born into different language groups, and they're never going to be able to think objectively about the way the world is or even communicate meaningfully with people in other language groups. So that's going to be one variation. And that's a philosophical issue that's been powerfully advocated in the 20th century, and it feeds into our our positions right now. If you think that people are born into different economic circumstances, and again, those different economic circumstances dramatically mold people into different kinds of beings, then you're going to have a class warfare understanding. The classes will never be able to understand each other, and they don't even have the same economic issues. If you think it's a matter of ethnicity, not so much economics, that you're born into an ethnic group, and language might be a part of that, economic issues might be a part of that, but rather it is your, you know, your, your Polish ethnicity or your Korean ethnicity that gets deep and that shapes who you are. And so first and foremost, you're not an individual, but rather you're a Korean or you're a Pole or whatever. Then again, you're going to have a different understanding of uh, where values come from and so forth, and a different kind of politics. So is this at heart the problem arising out of identity politics? It is. It is. Yes. Yeah, so uh, this is why uh, I think the, the philosophical debate over volition versus determinism yeah. is, is fundamental. It's not an accident that all of the classical liberals were strong believers in volition, individual moral responsibility. The Marxists are pure environmental determinists. Uh, the the, the Saper-Whorf hypothesis linguistically that I just threw out, mm. very powerful in, uh, in linguistics. American pragmatism of the John Dewey variety, very much a collectivized understanding of, of, of human formation and anti-individualistic. And I think it's also important to emphasize the biological versions of this as well. So if you are, uh, 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 for example, take Freudian psychology, which is very biologically based, that we have as human beings instincts that have been bred into us in varying degrees. Well, you're not really an individual with any sort of autonomy to think about it. Rather, you know, your, your individual rational agency and your moral agency is just this very thin civilizational veneer that's laying over underlying instinctual biological drives. Pretty and sad so, and low view of human, well, it your, is. your fellow humans, really. What identity politics has produced, certainly in this country, is a desertion of the idea that we ought to celebrate and participate in freedom, and if we're responsible, we will look for people who are still being marginalised and try and include them, you know, out of a generosity of spirit and doing what you ought to by your neighbour because, you know, that's the right thing to do, to a situation now where we say to people, well, you have rights, uh, but by the way, they're uh, clashing rights, so you've got to compete for your rights. Mm -hmm. And so we've set up all of this discrimination uh, and anti-discrimination legislation in this country over the last nearly 60 years now. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and you have your rights basically determined by technocrats increasingly, mm. including in the legal profession and in the courts. Uh, and so now we have to go and compete for our rights. Somehow it's very counterintuitive. It's nowhere near as noble as saying we'll celebrate freedom, we'll exercise freedom, and we'll try and create the greatest freedoms possible for ourselves and everyone around us. Yeah. Well, or is that just too simplistic? Well, uh, no, that's a good, very good summary of uh, some complex territory. So the core concept of rights there, what happened in the 1960s, I would say this was a perversion, but there was a transmutation in the understanding of what a right was. So in the, old, uh, in the tradition of rights, uh, you know, a right is a, is a freedom, it's a protection of the individual. I have a right to my life, and you have an equal right to your life. That then is to say, I'm in control of my, I'm not a subject of the king, I am a citizen. In a, in a society. I can't dispose of your life, you can't dispose of it. It's a, a, a self 
control position. I have a right to liberty, I have a right to action, and you have a right to action. And of course, at certain points, uh, we might collide, but then we will have mechanisms in place to decide who should have the right to, uh, to move in that. Or I have a right to my property. So if I have created some value in the world, I have stakes and claim, I've made some resources uh, uh, more productive, uh, I have a right to the product of my, of my labor. And none of those are, are contesting rights, because then they're saying, uh, you know, my body, my life, and, and my productivity belong to me, and equally the same can be said, said for you. What happened, though, is the older uh, concept of entitlements or uh, uh, charity or philanthropy, then we say, well, what do we do about the people who are not keeping up or who have fallen behind? And we might think we have some sort of obligation to give to them, to help them out and so forth. So we would call that philanthropy or we might call that charity. But then that starts to sound a little bit demeaning, right? right? And so we don't want to say that these are charity cases. So rather than saying, I, I am giving to you or we are giving to you as a society, as a matter of philanthropy, that you really are entitled to this. You're, you're entitled to a piece of the social pie, whether you have uh, contributed to it or not. And then that entitlement starts to be called a right. You have a right to it. Now, once you go down that road, then of course rights start to clash because if I have fallen by the wayside and I'm not earning my own way in the world for whatever reason, uh, but I have nonetheless a right to other people giving to me, then that is an infringement on you. That is to say that your productivity belongs to me to some extent. Now, naturally, you don't necessarily want your productivity to belong to me by right, and so you're going to uh, contest that to some extent. So I'm asserting I have a right to this, and you're saying you have a right to your property, then we have a collision. And then that set of rights sets you up for a collision understanding of rights. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.